Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is author Diane Dixon and actress Rachel Baylett. Screenwriter, author, Diane Dixon traveled the world as a child. She lived in South America, England, and the United States. She graduated from Occidental College. She's written extensively for American and European TV, and she's been twice nominated for an Emmy Award. Diane's taught at Pitzer College and Chapman University. In addition to all the writing, she must have this great gift of gab, because for five years she co-hosted a drive time talk show. What did you talk about? We talked about everything. We had a problem, though, <laughs> because we were on at 3 in the afternoon. So as you well know, the news breaks in the morning, and everybody talks about it all during the day. Exactly. And we're left coming on, how do we make this fresh? So we sort of became the idiots in the afternoon. We took the lighter side of very serious topics. But so was it scripted? No, absolutely It's all ad-lib? All ad-lib. For how, how long was the show? The show I mean, was the from duration. three to seven every three day, to five four, days a week. Uh, four hours? Yes. But you know, my, my absolute blessing was the fact that I worked with Peter Tilden, and Peter made it so much fun to do, and also he's so witty and so fast, it's hard not to just bubble right along with so, him. So, did you go with Peter, or did Peter choose you, or how does that work? <laughs> Absolutely, Peter chose me, because I, I never set out to be on the radio, and he and I were put together through this incredibly insane agent that we had. As writers, we were put together as a writing oh, team, I see. and then I found out Peter was on the radio, and he invited me to join him for just one little bit of business that he wanted to do, and then, as they say, the rest was history. Is that right? So you stayed on there for a long time? For a long time, and we had a great time. And then it. where did he go on? Well, Peter went on, he stayed at KBC for quite a while. I, radio was never my choice, so I kind of wanted to get back to the writing. It was hard for me to get everything done. Couldn't you write at the same, couldn't, if it were just ad lib well, or Well, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. I could have, but I think my heart wasn't in the performing. It was really in the writing. And you know, writers are, are hermits, and it's hard to be a hermit and be on the radio at the same time. But it seems like you're not really performing because you're in a, you know, we're performing now. We have a camera on us. True. But you, you have nobody around you. All they have to do is listen to you. And you can have all these notes, and you can be in your pajamas. <laughs> you don't you're have right. to be made you're up. Right. I can't argue any of it, but it I think just, I am so quiet a person at heart and so insular that even that, <laughs> even having to show up and sit in front of a microphone was way oh too much. Oh my gosh, yeah. it's like, that That sounds like the easiest kind of thing for me to do. Um, what were you Emmy nominated for? Uh, I was Emmy nominated for uh, several episodes we did of a show for Howie Mandel called Bobby's World. Uh, it was an animated show. It was on Fox, and we were on oh, for eight was. years. We, Is that right? Yes, we lasted forever in animation years. It was a long time. So, so um, you went from animation to Howie Mandel. Well, well Howie, Ma <laughs> Howie Mandel was the animated show. It was, was for me. Howie. He did the voice of this four-year-old named Bobby Jenrick, and the voice had come out of his stand-up act. And in the stand-up act, it was a little mm, more adult. And we had to tone it down for. for so were you doing all the writing? I was supervising all the writing. You were, so you weren't even writing what you wanted was, to do. No, I was writing. I was doing a lot of, I did a lot of the scripts, for, but I did, I mean, we were churning out scripts at a rate that no one person could do the whole Is series. Is that what happens? Yeah, it was. Because you're on for so long? Oh, yeah, we, had, we were on for a, a long time, and we were wildly popular. I mean, Howie's talent was just enormous, and the cast we had was brilliant. And, and how, the do you, were good. how do you work with that animation? You're back into that little room again with yes, the microphone. Yes, except this time, except there was no <laughs> microphone, and it was Wonderful fun, though, Joan, because the, the way it worked is <laughs> Howie and I would be there with Howie and two Im fabulously talented writers, Jim Fisher and Jim Stahl, and then Peter Tilden, my partner from the radio. Oh, he was And a, we would oh. sit, the five of us, and come up with all the stories. Then we would bring in writers and tell them the stories we wanted to tell and work closely oh, with them. And oh. it was just a beautiful 
wonderfully funny. So series. that's where the supervision comes in. Yes. The ideas are already given. Right. You know what you want. And then I edited the scripts, worked uh, with the writers, make sure it came out to be a Bobby's World. And then the animation. And then the, yeah, then the voice actors come in and the animation is done and it hits your television on a Saturday morning. How long? It must take so long. It's a terribly <laughs> long process. Because I mean, sometimes in episodes would come on and you get letters and you think, I didn't even remember. I know, did I do that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, from that, or as you were doing that, you write your first novel. Hmm. It was after I finished with the animation, actually, and I had been lucky enough to find work in Europe doing a very adult oh. show oh, um, you for did? Sky oh. TV. Yes. Oh, oh, for Sky. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun. And it was about young flight attendants flying around the world doing what young flight attendants do when they fly around the world. And uh, after that, I came home and I thought, you know, maybe I'm ready to do more adult things. Maybe my children's and family writing time is behind me. And that's when I was ready to start the novel. How long did you stay in London to do that? Um, well, uh, With Sky. Well, Sky was in London, right? Right, right. And I worked for, a co for Jane Hewland was the producer, and her company was called Hewland International. And I stayed there. She had me in London for about four or five months while so we did all the writing? research. So you were yes, writing? You were writing, writing, writing? writing the pilot and getting all of the background for the show together. And then I came home and wrote several episodes after we got the show up and going. Oh, you still came here and wrote. Right. So it continued. It continued. And, and when you do something like that, like the animation um, or Sky TV in England, can you do anything else? I mean, mm. are you writing for other things? Um, I couldn't when I was on Bobby's World because there was just so much going on and the radio. So that my plate was very full. When I was in England, I was also doing doing the Sky thing. I was finishing up some contracts that I had here left over and other. I did um, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, the animated series, and I was doing some. You know, can't so so, so you your can mindset, ride both you bicycles. Can ride, yeah. yeah, I was right. wondering about your mindset on that. Yeah, you have to really, but very perceptive question. But you really have to keep the two separate. Because <laughs> I, I wonder how you how you would do it. Uh, when I was reading the reviews of your work, it said your characters dance off the pages. How lovely. <laughs> you like to hear that, <laughs> I right? Like that. Yeah, yeah, they dance off the pages. So you've done all this work, you've done all these screenwriting, and now you think you're ready for your first novel. Mm -hmm. So where did the idea come from? Because I tell you, I was just gripped. Gri I mean, it's gripping, the language of secrets. Oh, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Oh, I loved it. I couldn't, I mean, I read it every night. And I'm going right. like, is this her story? Where did she find this? Oh, I wow. mean, there's so much depth to it. I'm so glad you had that reaction to it. And in response to your question, where did the idea come from? I think the truthful answer would probably be that for a very long time it was Parts of it were bouncing around inside my head. I just didn't know how to assemble them and make them be a whole. And one night I had um, just finished an assignment where a producer who had a f film deal at Sony had a romantic comedy script that he wanted a little polish done to. And it, the money was fabulous. The time involved was short. And I thought, oh, absolutely. So I did it. And he said, oh, when you're finished, rather than simply emailing it, bring it in. I want to you know, hear any ideas you may have of your own in case you want to pursue them. And it was a Monday morning, 10 o'clock meeting, and Sunday night at about midnight, I thought, oh my goodness, I forgot to think about ideas. What am I going to do? Exactly. <laughs> I forgot to think about think. Exactly. <laughs> I forgot to think. And I think, I don't want to go in there tomorrow morning looking like an airhead. So I run downstairs, and my husband's still up watching TV. I said, please, 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 back in the day when you were in college and you used to write short stories, was there anything you didn't use that you could just give me a shred of that I could take tomorrow to just not look like an empty-headed woman? And he said, well, do you no good? It's only one sentence. I have no, word, no idea where it goes. And that sentence was. I have no idea where, where it goes. goes. Oh, he, okay. said, I never, oh, he, he, yeah, he said, I never was able to get anywhere, but I always I wanted to be able to, never could figure it out. The sentence was this. What if a young man goes back to his hometown, knows everything about the town and the people there, and no one has a clue as to who he is? And I thought, you're right, that goes nowhere. And the next morning I woke up and I, I thought, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I know, I know why no one knows him. And it has nothing to do with horror, the occult, or anything like that. There's a real explanation. And that was the beginning. And so I went to the meeting and I turned in my work and I said to him, the producer, I said, I do have an idea, but I can't talk to you about it because I want to go home and write it as a book. Because I just knew. Oh, you didn't want to give there. it to them. No, no. Because <laughs> I knew it. You know, just in your gut <laughs> yeah. when you know you're there and I was I'm not there. giving this to you. <laughs> so. I started wondering how much of it was uh, autobiographical, too, because you have traveled around a lot, mm -hmm. and I don't know about your family, but there were like 
these flashbacks, they weren't really flashbacks, they were written at the time. Mm -hmm. So two I felt like I was at yes, uh, two yes. different periods of time mm -hmm. coming together all the time, which I thought was difficult too. That was a bit of a balancing act, but wonderful fun once you learn to do that sort of French braid and keep the story intersecting and then you know the two stories separate. Um, in it, response to your question, how much was autobiographical? Um, it's difficult to say. I think any novelist who's doing a good job of storytelling brings themselves to the book. I can't tell you that there are specific sequences that were lifted directly from life and posited into the novel, but having lived a rather interesting coming up, I lived in a lot of different places and was not raised in a traditional way by people who were you know, interested in my welfare necessarily. So that I think the spirit of that went into the book that's rather what, than, than the incident. That's what I was wondering when, when I knew you had traveled around a lot. Mm -hmm. But it's just like a portrait painter. The, you know, he has so much of himself in that. Even though it's a portrait of you, you'll see his hand. Exactly. So that's why I wondered how much the language of secrets had uh, Diane Dixon in it. I think it has a lot of Diane Dixon's heart and psyche in it, but not necessarily the history. So it. tell us what, what the um, title means. Uh, the title. The language. Well, I'm going to be completely honest with you. Uh, that title came quite late because when the book was bought, the manuscript had a completely different, a very boring title. It was called The House on Lima Street. Oh, because and that's where he goes back to. Exactly. That was the hometown and the place. And it was explained to me by the publishers, and it made a lot of sense once it was explained. They said, no, you need a title with a little bit more evocative language so that not only does the potential reader, are they drawn in by the title, but you get better cover art because oh, the yeah. artist is then given something to sort of go with. And so I must have submitted 30 different approaches to a title, and that's the one they went with. And after it was chosen, I realized, oh my goodness, that is the title. I just hadn't known it. It oh, was you, a perfect title. You did pick a, a, yes. a bunch of titles. But some of these scenes were digging so deep into as the psyche, as you were talking about, your mm -hmm. psyche being involved in it. Was it emotional for you to have to write those things? There were times, and I was surprised by it, because it I didn't occur like, to me that it would be emotional for me. And it didn't occur to me that, it, but readers have said, oh yes, it, it affected me, the reader, too. There were times, honestly, yes, that I, I would have to just stop for a minute because I could feel tears coming. Well, because if you talk about adopting, or you talk about giving your child away, that you, I mean, there's the m emotions of both parents and both sides, and all, I don't know, the language of the men, how you came up with the, what they said and how they felt. That was an interesting one. A lot of people have asked that, especially men. You know, how b before they read it, they say, "Well, how could you, you know, say presume this, to write exactly that man's right. point of view?" And the truth is, I've spent almost all of my working life in the company of men. I mean, mm. go back to your other question about the the Bobby's rule: locked in a room for eight years with, with four, four guys. other guys, exactly. right? And the truth is, I I began. I have come to see men as certainly separate from us. As, uh, their, their minds do not work the way the totally. female mind does finally, at all. Finally, no. as you get to be this age, you right. understand that they're no different. Exactly. They're no. not trying to be difficult. They're just different. <laughs> That's right. And so I've, I've developed a great empathy for men and, um, and really have listened very carefully to the way they speak and the way they feel and the, where their emotions go and then how they are expressed, which is not the way you and I would do it. And that, all of that went no. into the book. Did you have to research that adoption, the legalese that went along with it, that disassociated memory? Mm -hmm. you All had of to that research? had to be researched. And it was, it was fascinating. And some of the stories talk about getting a little bit teary. I mean, the stories were just heart-wrenching. Things that you oh, couldn't you make up. As I was researching them, unbelievable stories, unreal. Did TV, writing for TV help or hinder this? Do you know, I think it helped. I really think yeah, it helped. Yeah, I would think it would. Mm -hmm. And I think how it helped is that, well, you know, you look at a script page, it's mostly white, uh -huh. and then dialogue down the middle. Right. So you really learn to get that dialogue down and g have people speak in character and keep those oh, characters fresh oh, and real I as see. they exchange dialogue. And that really helped in the writing of the and, book. And one last question before we leave. It's, I have so many questions to ask you about the book. Uh, but do you go to book clubs? You have questions in the back for book club, which I thought was very interesting. Well, I didn't know that I would be. But once, let's see, the novel's been out for about six weeks now. And yes, we are already getting um, requests from book clubs. They call I'm looking you to forward come. to it. Yeah. yeah. And, and but you've fun. got a list of questions in the back. Mm -hmm. the, the publishing house put those in there so that book clubs would have um, a place to jump off. I thought off that on. was really interesting. Well, I'll tell you, when we go off the air, I have a lot of questions to ask. <laughs> I can't you. wait to talk to you more. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this part of the show. We'll be right back with Rachel Baylett.
Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with Boston-born actress Rachel Baylett, who started her career as a broadcast journalist. After she directed and produced a film on volunteerism for the Clinton-Gore campaign, she moved to Los Angeles to concentrate on acting. Rachel's trained at the Lee Strasberg Institute, in the classics, and with improvisational groups. You've seen her on stage, in film, and on TV, and she's also appeared in a lot of commercials. Were they fun? <laughs> uh, fun, humiliating. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, commercial work for you? <laughs> yes, I've had some rather interesting commercials, including chasing Chicken McNuggets down the beach. And oh, you have big national commercials, right? Yeah, the big uh, ones. So, so did you start with commercials, or did you start TV, stage? I started uh, with a combination of commercials and television at the same time. I mean, I came to Los Angeles and I wanted to get my feet wet in anything that I could. Commercials seem to be the easiest thing for an actor to get going in. Is it? Yeah. But it's, it seems like it would be hard. I know actors always do commercials, but it seems like it would be hard because you're up against normal people who don't want to be actors. This is true, uh, but if you have a particular look, which uh -huh. is unusual, then you have a niche right there. And so I think when I came to Los Angeles, I was quite the character. <laughs> you were like, like what niche? Like I really worked it, you know? I was just really quirky. I used to wear this little funny hat and I was, you know, put on glasses and I would do anything to get to just sort of be unusual and you know I pulled it back a little now but I think in the beginning I would go to these commercial auditions and uh, I would go all out you know I'd book one as Bo Derek doing the braids in my hair or whatever it took I would prepare for it. Did, did you need an agent or is yes. that because oh you do you still need an agent you because you can agent. show up can't you? Well they don't like it. Oh they <laughs> <laughs> they don't like it if you crash auditions. Oh, I see. So you had an agent and you still went for your quirky look. Still went for my quirky look. I see, I see. Did you take broadcast journalism? At, you went to American University? I did. I did. I had oh, a wonderful opportunity there. And uh, oh. it's a great school because you're right you know, outside of D.C. And so you can get these wonderful internships. And Is that how the Gore-Clinton thing came about? You know, out of that school? That didn't really have anything to do with the school. I had, I was so moved by that. It was the re-election campaign and I was very moved and I really wanted them to win. And so I came up with this idea. I was working in a volunteer office and I was so inspired by all these people that were giving their time for free and they were so passionate about their causes. So I just got a camera and started shooting and interviewing people. Oh, you did? How and long was that piece? The piece was about 15 minutes. Well, that's pretty good. Right. Not and you bad. wrote it? And I wrote it. I had a little little help, technical help, but most of it I did myself and I would basically go to campaign events and sometimes I had to disguise myself and pretend I was like with the opposite camp. You couldn't be, you couldn't wear your quirky hat. No, no, not at all. <laughs> your dark glasses. And I would sneak into events with my camera. I also, during that time, worked the motorcade and oh, yeah. so I got to get as close as I could to the president. I met him a couple times and it was a very, very rewarding experience. So do you think that was really good training for your acting? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, actually, it, it could have been, right? Politics, the way you were acting. Changing. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I think they, they share a similar element of um, how you present yourself. You were actually directing, though, and producing this thing. Mm -hmm. So you had to play all those roles. Yes, it prepared me for it prepared what was to come. <laughs> but, and then when, when you started taking classes, I mean, um, in acting, it's quite a bit different than broadcast journalism. Mm -hmm. You know, I had wanted to be an actor since I was a little girl, and I got side swayed um, by journalism. I don't think I quite had the courage to uh, really claim my career as an actress. So I took this other mm. route and once I made that film I said, well why can't I make a pilot? So after I was done with the Clinton film I made a pilot and I realized, oh. You I, made a pilot of yourself? I you made a pilot. It? <laughs> it's called Rach. <laughs> and it's, For Rachel. <laughs> yeah. And I did. I made a little TV pilot. We came close to selling it. And really? Good for you. Yeah. It's a cute little story. So you were like really pushing. I mean, you've been like helping your career. I've always felt like I've had to. I'm not a kind of person to sit back and wait for things to happen to me. I, I need to be working on projects and I always felt like if 
why not? Why can't I? I always felt like everyone has a fair shot in this world. Right. Why can't I make something? And that's propelled me my whole career. Did you come from a big family? Uh, small family. Small. So small. You, but were, were you always uh, the center of attraction? Uh, no. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> I had my bratty the, years. The confidence to, uh, to, to it, want to do this and to work hard? Because you have to have confidence and you have to have work ethics. Work ethics I definitely get from my family. I, I have a large exterior family. I grew up with uh, two brothers. and. I would say that it took me a while to gain the kind of confidence uh -huh. I needed to come out to Hollywood, but I do come from an artistic family. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. Oh, so that helps. I it mean, helps. I think it's in your genes. And then why would you study the classics? Because they're so difficult. They are. They are. It is difficult. It was a personal challenge to myself. Mm. And I did so many Shakespeare plays at these theaters in the valley and, you know, five people show up or, you know, I was with the Los Angeles Classical Theater Lab and it's, it's hard to get audiences in Los Angeles to see classical theater. But to me, it was a personal challenge. I felt that I really couldn't call myself an actress unless I studied the classics. So I started with this wonderful teacher at Strasbourg and we worked our way through the Greeks, the Romans. Oh, that's great. All the way up through Shakespeare. And... Now I'm not afraid you can hand me any kind of material and I feel like I can take it on. Well, that's where the uh, improv part comes in, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can just, that, but to me that seems like it could be an out, out um, reach from the broadcast journalism, having to be able to stand up there and talk. Right. <laughs> so here you are in training. improv. Yeah, so that must have been good. Yeah, I, I'm almost tempted to go back to reporting now because now <laughs> I feel like I even have less fear. And, you know, I was, I was very young when I was, I would be thrown in these internships. I'd be at the White House, you know, interviewing senators, and I didn't have the kind of uh, courage that I have now. When you study, you know, to be an actor, you really have to have all the pieces, and improv is an incredibly important one. It really is, but you were trained. If you're trained in broadcast journalism, now you can go back and be a weather girl. I could be. <laughs> That's actually how I started in Boston as a That's what I was gonna ask meteorologist <laughs> assistant. assistant. I was the weather girl, yeah. Okay, so did all of these things help you with sugar happens? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what is sugar happens? Sugar happens. That's why you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Sugar happens is my one girl show. It's a one-woman show. Uh, it's a culmination of five years of hard work, and it is the story of my life, the first part of the show based on my life, written by a wonderful Emmy-winning writer, Sherry Coben. Yes, I saw that. But why is she writing about your life? Why aren't you writing your story? Well, the funny thing is, is that I probably will write part de, but <laughs> she did the first part because I... I kind of got tricked into doing the show. I would never have thought I would have been able to do a one-person show. We were introduced, and she was supposed to be writing me some stand-up. Oh, I see. And I so, see. So it started in a different way. It started in, someone introduced us who wanted to see oh, me on stage, a producer at Sony, and I said, oh, oh, sure. And she spent a lot of time interviewing me and getting to know all about my life, and then she handed me a play, a full play. Why, why was she interviewing you? Just to talk? Well, the, the first I mean, just part of for the, the play improv part? is it's all about my life. It's all true. It's all about my family, my upbringing, all my, you know, my early romantic escapades. Okay, she she writes your story. Mhm. Mm she put she has the words that she puts in your mouth about your life. It's How do you do that? Well, it's wonderful. Isn't it right? It's really wonderful because it's like I have two people speaking through me. Okay. I have her sarcastic New York funny clever voice. Mm -hmm. Talking about my life. And, and just give us one little example of what. Anything? Anything, yeah. Uh, okay, um, let's see. Uh, New England Jews aren't like New York Jews. We're more assimilated, <laughs> more repressed. We eat our bagels, but with the crust cut off. <laughs> you know, is that how she does? gives me these quirky, you know, observations about life through her New York voice, and I'm a Boston girl. And right. the two voices together, my optimistic voice and her more mature, uh, sort of funny, cynical voice together forms this beautiful character, which is me, but also through a slightly different lens. I see. It's, it's you on one part, but it's somebody else actually talking to you in a way. In a way. Yeah. And then the funny thing is you have two different endings. You have endings of the future, right? I do. <laughs> How does that happen? It's a what if. 
Well, <laughs> basically, we the beginning of the show was I was just playing myself, and after about a year when we were developing it, I said I really want some more, and she said, "Well, I don't want to write more about you. Let me come up with something else." Is that right? So she gave me two what ifs in twenty years. Oh, that's right. So those are the endings, right? Two different endings. Well, you don't really know quite what happens. There are two possible endings, and then we threw in one third person at the end, ah. which is sort of the ending that everybody wants, the movie star. Um, and so you're left leaving the play really thinking about your life and really what makes you happy. So you've be become the movie star in 20 years that you're working on. But then what's the other ending? We've got a <laughs> housewife. Oh, yes, of course. Bit depressed who gets everything she says she wants. Mm -hmm. And then we have the character who I feel is the happiest, the lounge singer. And that's you? <laughs> that's the one you like? Are she you talks singer? like this. <laughs> Her name's Rachel B. And she's another version of me who just went with exactly what she wanted to do, and she's free with her life. So you really wonder in the end, and I do sort of tell you in the end what's really important. And basically, it's appreciating life. Phil uh, Ramuno. Wonderful. Your director. Yeah. How does he move you around the stage? What do you do? Well, because we a one person play is hard to it is. keep. Uh, the audience's attention. I don't stop moving. I do That's... four changes on stage. I have a shower curtain. I do all my changes on stage and four wigs, four chairs, and you know, oh, I'm on it. the go all the time. I don't stop. It's Once you start watching the show, it's like a roller coaster ride. I love it. Is there music, lights? There's music, and before you know it, the show's over, and you feel like you've had sort of some acid trip. I mean, it is really trippy because... Is most, it 90 minutes? It isn't. About it's about 80, 70. Oh. But most one-person shows, you know, you, it, it appears like it's going to be a normal show with me sitting and talking, and then all of a sudden it just goes crazy. And you see me running around the stage and changing characters and changing ages and types and wigs and clothing, and it's... I, I feel it's unusual. For... Seems like we're back to auditioning for commercials. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> I'm going like, what is Rachel doing? You're right. No, you're absolutely right. It has that insane quality about it. But since Sherry wrote parts of it of your life, and it's a different part, the second, you know, the second part of your life, can someone else play Rachel? Mm. Mm. I thought about that. <laughs> Have you? Yeah. Because yes. what if you want to send these shows on the road? Who can play Rachel Baylett on the road? I have thought about that. And it would be very strange for someone to talking, you know, talking about my mom and my dad. And, but in, in fairness to the play, it would be wonderful to keep it alive. So, so it, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. What about making it into a film? I'd love to do that. Is that, what, is that why you do a one, why do you do a one woman show? You do it because you want to get on stage and act your heart out. That's, a, That's why you do it. You do it because there are so few opportunities to really have your voice heard, to really connect with an audience, and to feel that you've absolutely used every ounce of yourself and feel so fulfilled. There's nothing like it in the entire world. It's taken a long time to get there. Mm. It took a long time to ride it. It yeah, took five all, years. It took that long before it got on the stage. Yep. And where is it playing? It is playing at the Sidewalk Studio Theater in Burbank, right down the street from Warner Brothers. So at Burbank, and what is Burbank that? near Pass Ave? Oh, near Pass Ave. Okay, because you have to think of some place easy to get off the freeway. Right. <laughs> Exactly. To get over there. Oh, and, and is it a 50, 49 seat house or This 99? is actually a 39 seat house. Oh, great. Uh, it's, it's a far change from uh, my last theater, which was uh, 100 in Hollywood and 200 in New York. Uh, but what we find is that it is so much better in the space because it's so intimate and people really get involved. So I'm enjoying it. Well, it's better than five people watching Shakespeare. Right. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and keep writing, J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 -N at AOL.com, the email, and 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. See you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.